Okay, thank you for joining uh, so late today in the, one of the last talks. Um, and I'm going to talk about static code analysis uh, and what I did in the last three years as research um, as part of my PhD. Um, and we will see how to detect automatically security bugs in PHP code. So um, I'm going to give you a short introduction why I have this strong focus on PHP. And uh, then I will go over to introduce a general approach for static code analysis uh, I chose and then how to detect first order bugs, um, the traditional security bugs, and then second order vulnerabilities. Um, and at the last step, I'm going to talk about how to detect PHP um, object injections and generate gadget chains uh, for those security vulnerabilities. So shortly about me, uh, my name is Johannes. Um, I used to tweet a bit uh, with the nickname Flux Reiners. Um, I have a, have a web blog and as I said, I. I did my PhD at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Um, and I worked as a security consultant uh, and I was a passionate uh, capture the flag player. So this soon led to the, to the desire of automating things. So I wanted to detect security bugs automatically in code. So um, I'm the initial developer of RIPS, an open source tool for um, static code analysis of PHP applications. Uh, and now I redesigned the whole tool and it's part of a a startup in Bochum now. So here's a little research timeline. So I began, be, began almost 10 years ago uh, to play with those little regular expressions. So I have to say in 2007, the PHP applications were more the PHP scripts, so it was a bit more easy. <laughs> um, still, I failed miserably with my regular expressions, um, so I stopped doing that. Well, it was enough for capture the flag contest, but it wasn't really enough for analyzing real-world applications. Um, so. I began playing with tokenizers and released the first RIPS version, uh, which, which is still open source, uh, but still it has fundamental limitations that lead to uh, false positives. It doesn't support object-oriented code. So I redesigned the whole tool again during my master thesis, and then in the past three years, I refined analysis and researched new code analysis techniques, um, and now it's available as a product. So why do I focus on PHP for so long? Um, well, that's relatively easy to say. PHP is, uh, just has like a huge market share. It's run on 82% of all websites. Uh, the OWASP website, for example, uses WordPress, that is PHP, um, just as, as an example. And for, as a security researcher, it's also fun, as you guys know. Uh, it has lots of oddities and pitfalls. We heard that in previous talks. Uh, so. Um, developers implement security vulnerabilities more likely in PHP applications than, than in other languages. So in the CVE database, actually 25% of all those um, already reported and documented vulnerabilities are related to PHP, uh, which is quite a record to make. And in a recent study in the website hacked report, they found in 97% of the hacked websites, they analyzed, I think it was about 11,000, um, that there was a PHP CMS running. So that's quite some motivation in analyzing PHP applications. The problem now is for today's PHP applications that they get more complex. Um, and if we want to detect security vulnerabilities in those complex million lines of codes, uh, then the manual audit becomes sometimes inefficient, right? Um, so here you see a core graph uh, of the WordPress index page, uh, which is quite a mess. And you can imagine how uh, yeah, difficult it gets to detect security vulnerabilities then in uh, even huge or more large applications. So the approach we are taking here is, as I said, static code analysis in order to automate the uh, detection of security bugs. And static code analysis has the huge advantage that we have full code coverage. So we want to detect all security vulnerabilities in the whole source code. Um, and static code analysis is able to analyze all different um, execution paths of an application while dynamic code analysis can only analyze um, the single execution path uh, that is actually run during analysis. And um, obviously the disadvantage of static code analysis is that there is, uh, that there ca it can lead to false positives because um, a software in the end cannot always decide correctly about another software, so we're limited by the halting problem and we have to base a, a bit upon, uh, upon assumptions. So, um, we will always have some sort of false positives um, in the worst case. 
Okay, the challenges specifically for PHP. PHP is highly dynamic. You have code evaluation, you have reflection, you can dynamically include code, um, and you have a variety of language features. So PHP comes with, um, I think, 5,700 built-in functions are documented. Uh, if you're missing the analysis of one of those built-in functions, then you, your data flow um, will not be analyzed correctly and you will not find the vulnerability correctly. Um, and we have complex vulnerabilities, as we will see later on. Next to the traditional types, we have those second order vulnerabilities we want to detect and those nice gadget chains for PHP object injection. Uh, and this makes it, this is our like, goal, research goal, to, to detect those with static code analysis. And the main challenge here is to not only find an approach that works, but also find an approach that scales to large applications, right? So it doesn't make sense to uh, find an approach that is really precise but takes like one year to analyze an application. You want to be really fast and quick to even build it into the, um, into the SDLC, for example, and you want to scale to those large applications without the need for to going to the source code manually and have some annotations because then you could basically um, already audit the code manually. So um, let's have a look how the approach um, that I used in the past three years uh, looks like from an overview perspective. Um, and this, these are separated in five steps. So what we first do is we take the source code of a PHP application, um, get all the source code out of the files, and split it into abstract syntax trees. Abstract syntax trees, if you haven't played with them so far, is basically that you tokenize each statement of an application um, and then those tokens are connected semantically in a tree structure um, according to the PHP syntax. Then in the next step, we split the abstract syntax tree whenever the control flow is deferred. So if you have different branches you can take during the control flow of the application, um, then the abstract syntax trees are divided here and added to basic blocks. So each basic block is single input, single output. There's no control flow defer within one single basic block. Um, an advantage of this is that we can then analyze the data flow of each basic block um, separately because the data flow of each basic block uh, will always remain the same. And then we can summarize what we have analyzed for each basic block in this block. So we analyze the data flow of one basic block and then store the analysis result in this basic block. And we do this because then when we connect those basic blocks to a control flow graph, uh, the edges here are the constraints uh, for the different execution paths, then um, we, can, we can perform data flow analysis upon, based upon the block summaries and we don't have to reanalyze what's happening in those basic blocks. So we can just analyze on those summaries. And um, once we analyze the whole control flow graph of a function, for example, we can create um, a data flow summary of this function and store the data flow summary uh, and connect this, the, the summary of this function uh, to this function. So whenever the, the function is called again, we can just reuse the summary again. And we don't have to reanalyze the whole function. Um, yeah, we perform backward circuit taint analysis. That means whenever we find some sensitive operation, for example, a SQL query is executed, then we try to resolve where does the arguments come from uh, used in that SQL query, and if they stem from user input, uh, then we have a security vulnerability. This is, this is like the high-level overview um, of the static code analysis approach we are using here, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go a bit more into detail in, in different steps. So um, what, we, what we then do is we refine this basic concept um, in, in another three steps um, in order to get the most out of static code analysis. So what we first do is we precisely simulate all those built-in features we are having in PHP. So, for example, we have different types of sources, different kind of things. Um, they are relatively easy to configure, but then again, we have thousands of built-in functions that are behaving differently. And um, we are modeling the data flows through those uh, built-in functions precisely, so we have different plugins running for those built-in functions in order to support, I we are supporting 1,000 out of those 5,000, um, so in order to support those that actually are uh, relative for a security analysis. So you can imagine today there's not only like a source flowing directly into a sensitive operation, so you don't have a get parameter directly used in a SQL query. Maybe it's transformed 
uh, through multiple of those um, built-in functions. And you want to make sure to analyze them in detail. Um, then we use this, as I introduced, this efficient concept of using block and function summaries. Um, and we transported this uh, existing technique also to uh, object-oriented code. So we are assisting our backwards-directed uh, taint analysis with forwards-directed object analysis. You will see this later on. Um, so we now are able to analyze object-oriented code and scale to large applications because Drupal, for example, reaches almost one million lines of code or Magento, so you have uh, today really large code bases you want to analyze. And as a third step, um, we are detecting security vulnerabilities um, that yeah, cannot be detected so far. For example, the PHP gadget chains. Um, in the end, we support 36 types of traditional security vulnerabilities as well as combinations for second order vulnerabilities. And those three um, security classes I want to talk about uh, in the next minutes a bit in detail. So let's start easy how we detect first order security vulnerabilities. And first order basically just means those are the traditional vulnerability types you all know. So for example, SQL, inject SQL injection, reflected cross-site scripting, they all follow the same concept. We have some user input, we have a, um, a sensitive sync, a sensitive operation, and if there's data flow between those two points, um, then we have a traditional first order uh, security vulnerability, uh, as I like to call it. Um, we also have security vulnerability types that we cannot detect uh, with a taint analysis approach. So for example, if you think of uh, weak cryptography, um, you can detect weak, cryptof weak cryptop cryptography um, with static code analysis, um, but your scanner cannot decide is this logically used in something that is like, uh, that is cryptic, uh, that, is, um, that is sensitive for a crypto context or it's unsensitive. So if you find an MD5 hash, you cannot tell is the MD5 hash uh, used in something sensitive or is it maybe just really used for hashing a map. Um, then we also have to consider security mechanisms. So next to sources and things, we uh, want to avoid false positives. So whenever the developer implemented some security feature, we want to make sure uh, we detect it in order to prevent false positives. And we have some uh, traditional examples here. So for example, the HTML entities function is uh, well known to be a sanitizer against cross-site scripting, but actually it just sanitizes um, double quotes and the lesser than and greater than sign. So whenever the security mechanism is used in the wrong context, we still have cross-site scripting. So um, for example, here in line one, HTML entities is used, and this is safe for line two, right? Because you cannot use the lesser than sign to introduce new HTML tags. But if single quotes are used, those single quotes are not encoded by HTML entities, so you still have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And those are the pitfalls uh, ben already talked about in a previous talk um, that we want to track and precisely detect with our static code analysis approach. So we don't just want to whitelist and say HTML entities is safe. We want to make sure we look for the context the same uh, is, can be applied to uh, SQL queries, for example. If you apply escaping uh, to data that is not actually used in a quoted context, then you still have a SQL injection vulnerability because you don't have to break out of the quotes as an attacker. So, um, as I said, the traditional taint analysis would be, okay, we have some source, we have a sync, and then we have a vulnerability, but we have to refine this to uh, look out for security mechanisms and also to look out for the markup context that is used. And this is called context-sensitive taint analysis. And I'm going to introduce an example now uh, how, we, how we are detecting those, those bugs. So we have here in line eight uh, this example that we have HTML use with a single quoted attribute. And um, there are different branches you can take here through the application um, that is uh, sanitized with HTML entities or typecasted. So we will transform this code into our abstract model and our abstract graph model. Um, we illustrate it uh, in this way here. Let's say, say this is our control flow graph. And then we, our uh, analyzer detects a sensitive sync. So we have the echo statement, and the echo statement is known to be affected to cross-site scripting. So we invoke an HTML marker parser. And the HTML marker parser tells us precisely um, 
I detected a diff uh, element with an ID attribute and it uses single quotes. Then we look where does uh, arguments stem from. So we first take the left branch here and we see, okay, there's a typecast, this is secure, so we can stop our analysis here. And then we take the other branch and uh, look uh, where does the ID variable can be resolved to. And we detect this HTML entities function. And we do not stop here, we just simply assign sanitization tags to this um, data symbol ID. So basically this is our representation here and we say, okay, HTML entity sanitizes against double quotes lesser than sign, so we apply two uh, sanitization tags here. And then we continue our uh, backwards directed data flow analysis, and then we see, oh, okay, we have user input, so this must be a security vulnerability if there are no sanitization tags applied for this context we detected. So we saw we have a single quoted attribute context, but we have only sanitization tags for the elements and for the double quotes, so this is a cross-head scripting vulnerability, although HTML entities was present. We actually did some studies, so we um, did a study paper where we have 25 applications. Um, they had like on average 100,000 lines of code, and we analyzed which markup contexts are uh, the most popular. Of course, this was HTML, because PHP applications are designed to print HTML code, and we have some SQL queries. And then uh, we could uh, make some nice statistics which markup contexts occur uh, more popular than other markup contexts, and also observe where are security mechanisms applied wrongly um, or more wrong than other security mechanisms. I'm not going to, into detail for all of those bars, but for example, we could see for a double quoted um, tag here uh, for HTML, there's mostly converting use, converting here is HTML entities, for example, that converts HTML characters, and whenever the developer decided to build something uh, himself with regular expressions, regular expression validation, or um, some replacing, where it's tr the developer tried to replace some character, then they were more prone to security pitfalls um, than uh, using other uh, security mechanisms. And the same for SQL injection. Um, Again, I'm not going into detail here, but just for example, the escaping was used uh, correctly next to type validation for single quoted SQL queries. Um, but whenever there was no quote used, um, there was still the escaping applied sometimes and we could detect those security vulnerabilities. So we could so make some nice statistics and then also use those statistics uh, to uh, improve our tool uh, by saying, okay, we focus on markup contexts that are more frequent than others. So we have the um, uh, markup uh, frequency here with this line. This means HTML double quoted context is the most popular markup context and the UL attributes are less popular, although they are more affected by security vulnerabilities. Those are the bars. Uh, and then we could see, okay, maybe we focus on those three in the middle. So whenever we see a JavaScript tag, this is more prone like user input in, within JavaScript text, this is more prone to security vulnerabilities or HTML text with a single quote used more prone to security vulnerabilities uh, than other attributes. Um, so we, we have a little demo now. Um, so in the end we found uh, remote uh, code execution. This was found by the Q53 guys using our tool. Um, I think it was last week. Um, and they found a remote code execution vulnerability in the latest PHP my admin version, which is which is fixed now, um, and let's just see how this could look like. So, just quickly type in here PHP my admin. So this is how the interface could look like for those code analysis techniques, um, and then we have an initial phase where the code is transformed uh, into those. A graph models first, so we have this parsing phase. Um, so the code is split in those abstract syntax trees, the control flow graphs are built, the summaries are built, and um, this is the first phase. And then we see here, for example, like a heat map where we say, okay, um, there are no security vulnerabilities detected so far. Um, and then our uh, next phase begins, now the actual scanning phase, and whenever we find security bugs, we can uh, list them here on the left side. Uh, and our uh, heat map also uh, should increase in a minute, or in a second, I hope, not a minute. Um, let's see what happens. 
So basically, PHP, my admin here, has about 250,000 lines of code, so it's quite large. So it takes a while to analyze, but the whole scan in total still takes only three minutes to finish on my laptop, uh, so it's quite fast. And okay, SQL injection is not that interesting in PHP my admin, right? Because you can execute SQL queries anyway. But um, also shortly there is the code execution um, coming. We can have a have a look at the code execution vulnerability already while the scan is still scanning. Um, and then we can see, okay, which parameter is affected by the vulnerability, the post parameter find. And in the end, it was used um, it was used in a prec replace, uh, so where you can tr truncate uh, with a null byte the regular expression um, and uh, append an eval modifier in PHP, and then the second argument would actually be evaluated as PHP code, and we would have this code execution vulnerability. Um, okay, this was a short demo. Let's see, okay, this again is almost finished, as we can see. There are some, actually PHP admin has thousands of SQL injections, but um, we also reported them, but uh, nobody cares about them, so they will just stay there. <laughs> okay, um, so let's have a look how we detect second order security vulnerabilities. So second order security vulnerabilities, for example, persistent cross-head scripting, um, basically mean for us from the perspective of static code analysis, that we have some user input, but on the first operation, this is sanitized, right? So if the payload is stored, for example, in a database, um, then it is safely written to the database first. There's no SQL injection going on. It's safely stored in a bit database, and then in the second step, the application might reuse our payload we stored in the database, and we have a second order vulnerability. And we also call uh, or introduce the term like multi-step exploits, basically, um, it's just a term for the case where you have some user input triggering a security vulnerability, and the security vulnerability allows you to obtain more persistent data stores than the application's logic would actually allow you to do so. So for example, if you have a SQL injection in an insert query, uh, of a, uh, insert SQL query, then you can taint more columns that you can actually write to, and then the application might assume this is like a static column, a static values, uh, and then we have a second order, uh, we have a multi-step exploit because you're exploiting in the first step something and then you trigger another vulnerability, just for the terms. Of course, this, use, uh, this can be used uh, with all different ki kind of combinations, with user input, with persistent data stores, so not only databases, also file names if you have a file upload, or the session variable, which is, which is basically uh, file content by default, um, and then you can have all kind of combinations for uh, second order vulnerabilities. Um, so let's get back how we analyzed for first order vulnerabilities and then we see what's different to detect second order vulnerabilities. So let's say we have this insert query here, so we try to resolve where the variable name, for example, uh, comes from. Um, so we have our analysis model again and we see, okay, name comes from user input, so we trigger our SQL injection vulnerability report in a simple example. Um, now what happens if there is sanitization in place? We have the sanitizer here. Um, this is, uh, it applies uh, escaping, so there is no SQL injection. Um, so our analysis will tell us, okay, there is no SQL injection here. But since we are invoking those markup parsers to tell us which context is used, and we are also doing this in uh, SQL queries, we see that, okay, our SQL markup parser can then also tell us um, not only the position, but also is it like a writing SQL query or a reading uh, SQL query. So it can tell us, it doesn't use select, insert, update whatsoever. And then we can use this information and say, okay, this is writing to the table users, and the first column is tainted. Um, so we store this in our analysis environment. We, we let our scanner know, know table users, the first column name here, this is um, possibly tainted by user input. And for the detection of those multi-step exploits, we simply extend the analysis for a SQL injection in an insert query, and we say, okay, we have SQL injection insert query, that's great, um, because then as an attacker, we can also taint all up-following co columns. So in the column a role, there's not only be admin and user anymore, static values, uh, but also the attacker can write some data there. And then as the second step, 
uh, whenever we detect that, is, that data is read from the database or from the persistent data store in general, um, we detect this by uh, doing the following. Whenever we resolve uh, from a sensitive uh, sync, for example, the echo operator, the data, and we see it comes from a persistent data store, there's some reading going on, then we create a temporary vulnerability report. And we say, okay, we have here the table users and the column name that is selected, and we don't know yet if that's a security vulnerability, but we store a temporary security vulnerability report. And uh, in the end, we can connect um, those collected readings and writings to persistent data stores uh, and then see um, is this temporary vulnerability report indeed a security vulnerability. Uh, so we check is the column name stored in our analysis environment as tainted, it is. Is this data stored here um, sanitized against the vulnerability type we found? Because the developer could decide to store sanitized data into the database. And if that's not the case, we can create a second order vulnerability report. Um, so for example, we found a remote code execution vulnerability um, in combination with other bugs uh, in OpenConf. Uh, this basically looked like that you could abuse a SQL injection or cross-site scripting vulnerability to gain administrator privileges, and as an administrator, you could change a header file value in the database, and the header file database value, you could point this to a paper you uploaded uh, to this um, platform. So I have to add OpenConf is a conference management platform, uh, so you can upload your own papers there, store the PHP payload in this paper, and then point the OC header file value to this paper, and then you would have the remote code execution vulnerability. So now you might say, okay, OpenConf, who uses that? Uh, OWASP, for example. So if you want to apply for, <laughs> but it's safe. Um, okay, now for the uh, last part, the gadget chain detection. Um, I first go quickly into PHP object injection. I know there was a talk uh, already about um, object injections or unserialized vulnerabilities in Java. This is similar uh, to PHP. So basically, the attacker can inject an object into a PHP application and stack multiple objects in the object he is injecting. And based upon the objects he's injecting, the control flow is deferred to different methods of different classes. So to illustrate that, we have here a white object, a green object, and a blue object, and the control flow is then deferred to the white class, green, and blue class to, in the end, trigger code in the red class where some sensitive code uh, can be reached. So um, to put this in an example, we have the class text here. Uh, we have the serialized feature in PHP that basically can take an object and um, turn it into a unified string representation, the serialized format. So we serialize this object text here, and um, then this will be the serialized string format. Um, and we have a PHP object injection vulnerability if the attacker can modify the serialized string format. So then the attacker is able to uh, change the class, for example, or the data that is within this, this object. So you cannot inject own PHP code, but modify an existing object that is transferred uh, to the different states of the application. So the in, uh, attacker would inject here a different, uh, a different class type, for example, or a different property, and if this data is unserialized again, um, then this object contains the data actually injected by the attacker. So this is how PHP object injection uh, works. And now the interesting part for PHP are those magic methods because those are called automatically upon specific events and if they are defined uh, in classes by the developer. So next to the constructor as the magic method, we also have destructors. And if we have, for example, the class file here that defines the destructor that um, deletes, deletes uh, a file based on the property file name, we can inject, uh, we can modify this class text here to file and add the property file name and point it to a file we want to delete. If this string is unserialized, then the file pro um, this file object is created, the destructor is invoked, and then the file name pr uh, property is used in the file deletion here and we can delete arbitrary files. Now, property-oriented programming comes in handy if there is no magic method, for example, such as in a destructor, um, that contains actually sensitive code. But it could be that this destructor is um, 
pointing to different code locations based upon a property. For example, here the handler property. And this handler property allows us, because it's under the control of the attacker, to jump to arbitrary close methods. So if we have, for example, here the interesting class process that on the close method calls a system um, um, command, then we can um, inject the process class into this property here, and then the close method over here will be called, and we can reach the sensitive code that wouldn't be otherwise reachable. And this is how we can chain those, um, um, those gadget chains or those gadgets together to reach sensitive code, as illustrated here. Then we can uh, terminate the, the command and inject arbitrary commands and have our command execution. Okay, there was a quick intro to PHP object injection vulnerabilities you already probably knew, but how do we check those PHP object injection vulnerabilities and those gadget chains now with uh, static code analysis? So PHP object injection basically is like a first order security uh, vulnerability. So there's no difference in detecting a SQL injection, for example. We have our sensitive sync uncivilized here, and we look, does that stem, stem from user input? Then we can simply trigger our PHP object injection vulnerability report. The new thing is now that whenever we detect those um, PHP object injection vulnerabilities, the return value of an uh, affected uncivilized uh, built-in function uh, is a flagged object, and we flag this object as tainted because the attacker can control all pop properties, so this object is flagged as tainted. And then we uh, propagate this object forwards directed through our analysis environment, and if this object is used or properties are used of this um, flagged object, then we know instantly, okay, we have a security vulnerability here. Um, so how do we detect those gadget chains now? Um, whenever we detect a PHP object injection vulnerability, we automatically invoke the analysis of uh, specific magic methods that can be invoked by an attacker. So for example, our destructor method here, we invoke the interprocedural, the, uh, the, the function analysis um, of this magic method destruct here, and we, we perform analysis of this method, and we see, okay, we don't know where this close method is called from, is, is called from, so we invoke the analysis of all closed methods throughout uh, the source code. So we, for example, analyze then the method close of the process class we already seen, and for example, this closed method of a database uh, class. And for those methods, again, we perform our taint analysis. So for example, we have the system call here. We try to resolve the PID property. It cannot be resolved, so it's stored as a sensitive property of this method. We store it in the analysis environment. For this closed method, there are no sensitive properties because nothing security sensitive is going on here. And then once we collected those sensitive properties, we apply those sensitive properties back to uh, the call site. So here the class close method was called here. So we apply those properties back to the handler property. And then we know this destructor is affected by a system command execution uh, for the PID property applied to the handler property. And then at the call side again, where our PHP object injection uh, happened, we apply those properties again. And since we already introduced that a flagged object says that each property that is touched automatically triggers a security vulnerability, we can apply, when we apply the PID and handler property to this flagged object, uh, we automatically have our gadget chain um, that reports us the remote command, uh, remote command execution chain um, and then we can connect this report to the PHP object injection. Um, so a bit earlier we found, for example, a PHP object injection in Joomla that allowed to um, execute arbitrary commands during the installation process, but not only for administrators, also for uh, remote attackers. Okay, so to come to the conclusion, um, we've seen that the requirements for static code analysis tools changed so um, we have divide, uh, diverse language features we have to uh, analyze precisely in order to detect those security mechanisms, for example. There are also encodings and decodings uh, we want to keep track of um, to really precisely uh, connect those built-in features and see how they react upon the, the markup context. Um, and we have those complex security types. We have second-order vulnerabilities, multi-step exploits, gadget chains we also want to detect, uh, and this is um, this has to be detected in growing code size. 
So we also could show that uh, our static code analysis approach works for the automation of bug detection. Uh, we can quickly identify traditional uh, security vulnerabilities such as cross-site scripting and SQL injection, uh, but also uh, more complex uh, types and um, remaining challenges, for example, are frameworks. Um, so where a lot of reflection is going on, you are always hindered a bit with static code analysis uh, to detect uh, those reflections or, for example, template engines. Um, and here some uh, framework-specific uh, models have to be applied or can be applied as one solution. Um, that's it, and thank you for the attention. So, are there any questions? Uh, so the question was how do we detect second order vulnerabilities when the user input comes from um, other sources than on the web server, right? On the, so, um, well, you cannot, you cannot know, right? <laughs> so what you can do is, uh, for example, if there's uh, data fetched from an URL, so the classical example would be a YouTube video, for example, is fetched and then the title is embedded into your HTML content. Um, you could say whenever data is fetched from a, from a URL, then this is assumed as tainted, um, which, is, which is one approach. But it's, I think the best way would be to, to make a whitelist for then specific domains or not, uh, because you cannot really tell if this data actually is taintable by an attacker because you don't know what's, what's going on there, right? So YouTube could always sanitize their titles um, and you, you cannot uh, actually inject something there. Yeah, then, then you cannot know unless the static code analyzer also analyzed the, the other application, right? So if you analyze both applications, then you can combine the analysis results, but if you on, only analyze one application, um, then you don't detect actually the writings, just the readings. Um, I mean, you could also configure your static code analysis to say whenever data is coming from a persistent data storage in general, I have a security vulnerability, but uh, I think that leads to too much false positives, so. But that would be one approach. The new version is uh, is a commercial product now. All parts are, are commercial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So the, the, the question was uh, if we are supporting pass sensitivity, uh, to put it short. Um, we do, I would say half. Uh, for some uh, constraints, we are resolving those and we are evaluating those. So if you have input validation within a constraint, for example, the if is numeric and then something is checked and we detect it. But um, for other things, we are pass insensitive. So um, an example would be if you have an error variable and this error variable is set to false and for different paths, then you set it to true or to false or to true. And then it's something completely different going on and in the end it checks if this error variable was, some, was, was hit to true or set to true or to, to false. Then this is like two different contexts and uh, our analysis would only analyze the security vulnerability but uh, would fail that there's something security independent uh, going on with this error flag variable and detect the security vulnerability. And there would be a false positive then. Oh, good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.